Max Richmond. I'm the President and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here today for what I believe will be a day of thought-provoking, stimulating discussion on retirement security. We have a distinguished group of national experts, policy, political leaders, business executives, journalists, whose research and experience and viewpoints, I think, will provide us with a, a comprehensive look at the options and <coughs> obstacles facing the policymakers around town. They're the ones who will uh, be working with, we will be working with, to chart the course for millions of people living in an aging and changing America. Uh, the idea, uh, the genesis, uh, if you will, for today's symposium began early this year. Uh, we at the National Committee, as many of you know, have been very involved in many advocacy campaigns and, and initiatives to expand the discourse on health and financial security of older Americans. And overwhelmingly, in our experience, in towns and small towns, large cities all over the country, in poll after poll, in survey after survey, we have found that the American people have responded very positively to our efforts uh, with a strong desire for proposals that will strengthen retirement security, not just for current retirees, but for all generations. And yet, despite uh, all of this, uh, what the public has been telling us, we have been listening to a constant drumbeat from conservative think tanks, economists, some in the mainstream media, pound away at the same message. And that message is, if progress is to be made, the future of Social Security and Medicare is to be secure, benefits have, have got to be cut. That does not make sense to me. It does not make sense to most people. Uh, cutting benefits is not progress. That can't work. That won't work. But we felt in order to open up a national discourse on retirement security and have a more constructive um, set of proposals and policy ideas that would deliver a strong uh, effect, a strong message, uh, we needed to um, deal with these issues and recognize the need to be what we feel and hope today will be a catalyst for a, a broader exchange of ideas. So we began this effort by seeking the guidance of, I hope you're not embarrassed by this, Senator Harkin, but by one of the, what I believe is the preeminent leaders on retirement security. I firmly believe that. And, and we will hear from Senator Harkin uh, later. He will be giving us a, a keynote address. So with the Senator's support, partnership with the uh, Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement at, at uh, Drake University in Des Moines, uh, we created an advisory board that included some of our nation's best and brightest uh, government, policy, academic, industry, advocacy leaders. And not all of them are here with us today. Most are. Uh, but I wanted to just <coughs> tell you who's on our advisory board, which is chaired by Senator Harkin. Uh, James Roosevelt. I saw Jim a minute ago back there. <laughs> you probably recognize the name. A tireless advocate for Social Security and who happens to be uh, the son of our founder, former Congressman Jim Roosevelt, who created the National Committee in 1982 to preserve what he felt was his father's greatest legacy, Social Security. His father happening, happened to be President Franklin Roosevelt. So thank you, Jim. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ken Appel, he could not be here, is with us last night. Uh, he's the uh, former Commissioner of Social Security and also the former Chair of our Board of Directors. Uh, some very uh, former distinguished members of Congress, Senator Fred Harris, Oklahoma. Fred Harris. 
and representatives uh, Ron Barber, Dan Maffei, and Lynn Woolsey. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, former Gov uh, Maryland Lieutenant Governor and founder of the Center for Retirement Initiatives here at the McCord School of Public Policy of Georgetown. Uh, Judy, Dr. Judy Feder, Dr. Judy Fader, uh, Professor of Public Policy at the school here. Uh, she'll be here later today. Uh, Neera Tandon, uh, President of Center for American Progress, and Phil Johnson, a former Massachusetts State Representative and someone we've all worked with for years. So we are very grateful, appreciative of the expertise and support, not only uh, uh, for today's event, but uh, as we try to amplify our work focusing on constructive strategies uh, and solutions for Americans workers, America's workers. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize uh, two of our uh, board members. We're honored that uh, Catherine Dodd, our chair of our board, flew across the country from California yesterday. Thank you for being here. And I'm not sure if Bill Vaughn, our vice chair, is here yet. There he is, Bill Vaughn, thank you. <clears throat> so none of uh, the uh, today's symposium would have been possible without this collaboration of the McCord School of Public Policy, the Harkin Institute uh, at Drake University, and um, the Georgetown University Center for Retirement Initiatives, which we thank Kathleen Kennedy Townsend uh, for uh, arranging. I also want to thank the Social Security Administration for the exhibit. It's right outside the door. Uh, you're never too young to sign up for my Social Security online account, so there are folks out there that can help you do that. Finally, I want to thank the sponsors of this symposium. They're listed in the program. We're very grateful uh, for their support. It made it possible for us to do this without charging any kind of a registration fee. And lastly, uh, the staff, the National Committee staff, a very dedicated, professional, resourceful staff. Especially I want to thank Julie Tippins, Pamela Causey, Dan Adcock, they're all here, Phil Rotundi, Emily Mills, and Grace Nelson who took on this project in addition to doing everything they have to do every day. And um, I want to make a, a, give a special shout out to Ellen Morgenstern, uh, where are you, Ellen? Ellen, Ellen is the inspiration for this symposium, and Ellen does not know the meaning of we can't do this. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen, for everything. So be before we begin this morning's session, moderated uh, by Paul Salman, who I just met, uh, you all probably have seen him on the PBS NewsHour. Uh, I think it's important to remember that we're, we're not here to say what's right or wrong as much as we're here to show that there are reasonable approaches uh, that we need to discuss. And we recognize that retirement security means many things to different people, but overall the expectations are fairly consistent. Affordability, access, independence, security and stability. And it's up to us, the folks in this room, to ensure that this is attainable for all older Americans and their families. So let me uh, start the program by welcoming our distinguished panelists who are here for the first session, Retirement Security, Keeping the Promise, Securing the Future. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to do this quickly. My, I've been introduced already, so I don't need to introduce myself, I suppose. Um, to my uh, far left, although that's a tricky term, I guess, uh, in this crowd, um, uh, Ma David Madland, uh, Managing Director, Director of the American Worker Project at the uh, Center for American Progress. I assume you all know what that is. Um, Colin Holden, to my immediate left, Professor Emeritus at University of Wisconsin-Madison, the La Follette. Uh, La Follette or La, La Follette? La Follette. Sorry, La Follette School of Public Affairs, uh, Social Security scholar, and in 86-87 worked uh, for Social Security in the Office of Research and Statistics. 
to my right, Larry Zimpelman, Chairman of the Board of Principal, the uh, big financial firm, uh, finan the Principal Financial Group, technically, uh, started as an actuarial intern in 1971, which is good news for would-be interns and actuaries. Uh, uh, they don't get a lot of good news. And a, and a Drake uh, undergrad and MBA. Yes, don't, <laughs> don't get too partisan here. And uh, finally, uh, Kilolo uh, Kijikazi, um, from the Urban Institute, formerly with Ford, a policy analyst at the uh, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities before that. Uh, I'm going to take this down so I don't pop my peas there, like that. Um, so I, I think everybody can hear me, even with this, right? In the back, everybody can hear? Yes, yes, uh, yes would be good. All right, so, so the name of this is uh, Keeping the Promise, Preparing for the Future. So I thought we'd start with Will We Keep the Promise? There's an old blues song, uh, The Mind Makes Promises That the Body Can't Keep. Um, so are we in that situation uh, here uh, too? Are we prepared for the future? And then the next questions which will come immediately are how are we to keep the promise and will we be prepared for the future? How, how will we be prepared for the future? Uh, so David, uh, let's just, uh, reading, well, I guess from the audience's point of view, reading right, left to right would be the other way, right? So then uh, I guess we'll go with Kololo first. Uh, first question, will we keep the promise? Absolutely. Um, and just to keep it brief at the beginning, and then I'll give more detail as we go along, but we will do so by restoring solvency in a way that doesn't burden low-wage workers or those most likely to be financially insecure. And we'll do it by improving uh, benefit adequacy so that those who are most at risk of uh, retirement insecurity will be uh, insured of the, the items that were, were stated, affordability, access, um, independent security, et cetera. You, you think even given the current complexion of the American political scene that, there will, that Social Security will be sacrosanct? Is sacrosanct? If we look at the surveys that have been done, for example, by the National Academy of Social Insurance, um, polls that have been taken of the general public, so when we get outside of the beltway and the contention that's, that's going on on Capitol Hill and actually talk to the public, we find that there is overwhelming support for Social Security and for improving uh, Social Security, even if it means increasing taxes. And this is true across uh, generations. It's true across income groups. It's even true ac across political affiliations. Uh, Larry, uh, will we keep the uh, promise? I do remember all those seniors rattling Dan Rostenkowski's car back right. 25, whatever, 30 years ago. So there is, as Kalolo says, a serious constituency. But when I talk to young people, they say, uh, Social Security, I'm not counting on it. It's toast. Right. Yeah, so f first I would say that um, I continue to uh, marvel uh, at those who were involved in the original design of Social Security because by my view they did just an outstanding job of balancing a number of very difficult considerations which really has to do with how much of the of the Social Security pie if you will goes to lower wage workers as compared to middle income or the more the more highly compensated and and as most of you in this room know there there is a a a a, a skew a positive skew in my judgment towards the lower wage worker and the kind of lower middle income worker uh, that's very appropriate uh, that's very typical for a social insurance system like social security the short answer to your question paul is we have the capacity we have the capacity to allow social security to remain essentially uh, in place and financially sustainable for the baby boom generation, it will take some amount of political courage in order to make the particular changes that need to be made, but in my judgment, they are relatively modest. The sooner we make them, the better off we are, and we can essentially preserve the value proposition for lower and middle income workers while ultimately putting Social Security on a sustainable financial footing for the millennial generation, and we can eliminate this view that uh, they're more likely to uh, see 
see a UFO than ever receive a Social Security benefit because Which is, that's a lot that's of just think that. yeah, but wow. that's and and that's an example of how this this group uh, is so important because when you have that sort of cynicism that is creeping into people who are going to be our future leaders, I think that's an issue we have to pay attention to. Take that down a little bit so you don't pop. Um, Karen, um, are we uh, have we made promises that we can't keep? Well, I want to say a few words about what is the promise. Uh, there are several ways to think about this promise. One is the promise to provide benefits that are currently expected, uh, which is very often the topic of the rhetoric going on about the current ability of the system to finance those. But there are other promises. One is the current promise to uh, to modify some of the risks that individuals are facing, death, uh, uh, disability, uh, unequal distribution, uh, your, your chances of being a low-wage worker, and are we doing that adequately to provide, as Max says, uh, the independence and security that the original system uh, promised. And then there's this third promise that I think we should be all thinking about, are what are the new risks that people are facing? We have high incarceration rates, uh, those are outside the system, but there are certainly a lot of implications for incarcerated fa people, families of incarcerated men and women. Uh, there's the immigration issue, how they are being dealt with as they come in both legal and illegal. Uh, and then the, our growing income inequality, uh, which is actually having a negative impact on the financing of the system as our uh, wage increases are increasingly concentrated above the uh, taxable limit and therefore we're replacing increasingly our, the, uh, the Social Security beneficiary population is coming from the group for which we have promised higher replacement rates. So we really need to think about what are the promises we made way back when about the future. David. Well, to me, there's uh, you know good ground to be optimistic, but there's some also reasons for real concern. And the, uh, let me explain a little bit what I mean. So the reasons to be optimistic, I think, are that the program is enormously popular. People support changes, as we've heard, and and even among, even among the young people, they're very very supportive of changes that will protect Social Security going forward, including increased tax taxation. So <clears throat> there's. Broad, broad political support. There's um, also, I think, a growing recognition of the importance of Social Security, especially given the changes to our private sector retirement system. So uh, more and more people that <coughs> depend upon the security that Social Security provides when there's less security in the private system. Um, but the, the real fear to me is it, it actually doesn't take much of an act of courage for Congress to act because it's popular. People like it. They want change. They want, you know, they, they, they want the, the trust fund to be extended out further. Um, but Congress needs to be able to do something. And right now we're in an environment where Congress can hardly do anything. They might even shut down government, default on our debts. And so, if you do nothing, which is the sort of default situation, you're going to, Social Security will continue on, but it will continue on paying lower benefits than what we expect. So we need to be able to do something. And, and I am not optimistic in the short term, despite the popularity, that Congress is going to uh, sort itself out. You know, it, I, I don't want to be too partisan, but we have a uh, Republican Party that has a very hard time doing anything uh, right now. And so that, to me, is the biggest worry and fear I think that can be sorted out by the time we get to, uh, you know, uh, 15, 20 years out when the trust fund uh, will start paying low, reduce, and, and we'll have to potentially pay lower benefits. But um, that's where I, I see real concerns. I, I can't help but ask this, even though it's not exactly relevant to this uh, panel. You actually think there's a possibility that the United States will renege on its debts? No, I, I don't. I, I, I <laughs> that was a no, but you started out with a kind of quizzical. The fact that it's even something to discuss, the newspaper, that it's even discussed to me is 
absurd and indicates how uh, dysfunctional Congress is right now. But no, I don't think we're actually going to default on it. But the fact that it's even something we're discussing here is a big source of concern. Because I see some people who are holding treasuries leaving the room to sell them now. <laughs> I think it's uh, once they you hear that. Uh, just just for uh, since we have so many experts up here, what, what percentage of Americans actually primarily depend on Social Security for retirement now, David? alluded to that. You guys want somebody know that? Yeah. I'm sure we have lots of people that can answer it. And we just <laughs> were being too nice. I was, assuming, I was assuming there'd be a slide up that oh. would tell us. The do you want to do it? Well, do you want to so, yeah, I mean, I think the, the general story is the majority of people depend upon Social Security if you, and then at, for the vast majority of their income in retirement, no matter how you want to cut it. So you, I think, you know, the estimates are around about 40 percent of people would be, uh, it, Social Security helps pull about 40 percent of elderly out of poverty. Um, and, you know, very, a very thin sliver of, of the population, maybe say less than 10 percent, really uh, only gets a fra small fraction of their retirement income from Social Security. So the, vast majority depend almost exclusively or very heavily on Social Security. And the average monthly payment from Social Security, 1300 1400 yeah. something like mm -hmm. that? Yep. Right. Somewhere in that range. And, that, and most people are depending on that. That level of benefit. That, which is 15000 a year or 14000 a year, something like that. Another, yes. another way to think of Social Security is that it is the largest financial asset that low and moderate income families have. So, all right, let's go back the same way we uh, went through the panel to begin with. So, Kalolo, so how do we preserve or, in your view, even extend Social Security given the current uh, political environment and, and even going into the future, assuming for a moment that the uh, Republican Party, I don't know why I would assume this, but assuming for a moment that it'll emerge from this uh, stasis or whatever you want to call it, quagmire, uh, what, how? How do, you, how do you preserve Social Security? How do you, and how do you extend it? So just in terms of the solvency piece, and, and recall I said we need to do this in a way that doesn't burden those who are already mm -hmm. at risk um, financially. So uh, there have been several proposals on the table for years, decades now, um, that we still need to, to take up. Um, so, for example, raising the, the cap on the maximum taxable wage, and there are a number of ways in which this can be done. There are proposals. Well, that, uh, stop for a second and explain that just so that we're all on the same page with what, what raising the cap would be, what's the current cap, and so forth. So raising the cap, so Social Security payroll taxes are not, um, are not imposed on wages all the way, on all wages for, um, for let's say, a high wage earner, there is a maximum amount of earnings on which payroll taxes are applied. If you are a low wage worker, a moderate wage worker, or even um, medium wage worker, then you're probably being taxed on, on all or most of what you, uh, you earn. And I think the cap is, what, um, 100, is it 118,000? 118,5. 118,5. 118,500. And it goes up every year. It's indexed. It, it, yes, it is indexed. But for workers who are earning more than that, they're not paying their uh, payroll tax on anything over the 118,500. And that's... Tw and that's 6.2 percent of your own income, 6.2 percent that the employer pays, so that's 12.4 percent of your total income, in effect, um, that after 118.5 you don't pay any of that, right? Right. So this, this is a, um, a, the, the regressive part of, of uh, Social Security, that lower wage workers have all of their earnings taxed, but higher wage workers do not. Now, the argument has been made that historically um, the, the payroll ha tax has been applied to 80, 85, 90 percent of, of um, all earnings, and that that has declined over time. So one argument has uh, been to raise this, uh, the, um, 
the amount of earnings that are actually taxed so that it covers, again, 90% of all wages. Um, others argue completely remove the, the cap so that all wages are taxed. Then you have to determine whether benefits are going to be paid on all wages that are taxed or on a portion of, of the, the benefits that are the wages that are taxed. The, do you not, the, the uh, Social Security Administration's own <clears throat> um, research said that if you raised it, I think, to cover 90% of all covered earnings, it's called covered earnings, which is earned income, uh, you would close, uh, I think it's a third or so, of, of the entire uh, long-term Social Security gap shortfall going out I into the future. And if you raised it to cover all earnings, uh, that, that is uh, back, so that there was no cap at all, uh, then you would eliminate most, uh, if not all, of the gap. I can't remember the actual number, the actual percentage. But it, I'm, I want to get back to the issue that young people tell me and that my co-author, I wrote this book on Social Security, co-authored a book called Get What's Yours, and my co-author, Larry Kotlikoff, professor at Boston University, is always saying, oh no, we're broke, the system is broke, it's bankrupt, and so forth. Uh, he's one of the chicken littles out there. Uh, and uh, how, how much should we be worried about closing this gap? So let me take on a couple of, of the myths that you just laid out there. One, the system is, is not broke, even if we reached um, 2033 without doing anything to restore solvency, and I don't think that that's going to be the case, um, there would still be uh, sufficient payroll tax and other um, Social Security revenue coming in to pay at least 75% of, of benefits. Right. But 75% is only 75%. Right. So I'm saying worst case scenario, but I don't believe that we're going to get to the, to the worst case scenario. Um, and I believe that, that we will make the changes that are needed in order to restore solvency. But just taking on the myth of the system being broke was the, the point that I was making there. The second myth in terms of Social Security not being there for the young is, is completely inaccurate. The, the program already provides for young. It is not just a retirement program. It uh, provides benefits for 8.5 million children who live in households that receive Social Security. It, pull, it pulls 2 million children out of poverty. And the value of the uh, Social Security insurance for young workers is there now. Uh, a 30-year-old worker who becomes disabled and is no longer able to work and has a, a, a spouse of around the same age and two young children will receive disability benefits that are valued at about $550,000. If that worker died, his, uh, uh, or the spouse would receive, um, the spouse and children, I should say, would receive a, approximately the same amount in terms of life insurance. So there is coverage for young workers already that most young workers or most workers, period, would not be able to afford in the private market and might not even be available to them in the private market. Larry, I, I want to press this point, and I should have, I suppose, pressed it in the beginning, which is this notion of this huge, you know, uh, I don't know, tr multi-trillion dollar gap. About 10. Well, it depends on what time frame you use, right? Time period. If you do an latest, infinite, latest report would say about 10 trillion. Well, all right, that's a fair. Uh, yeah, this is so, the old Everett Dirks and a trillion here, a trillion yeah, there. Right? Yeah, pretty soon yeah, it's real money. We, we, yeah. But at 10 trillion, we're really talking. We, we, I we, think we could all agree we're talking real money. Yeah. So how do, So is that not a, a huge problem? Uh, well, it it is a problem. It is a sol solvable problem. Now, I may differ a little bit. Uh, with Kalolo in the sense that, uh, first of all, today, in my judgment, Social Security does, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a positive skew, but is skewed quite significantly towards lower income and lower middle income workers. And it does that through what is called the replacement ratio, which is the way the Social Security benefit is calculated. So just to give you a frame of reference around that, for the very first dollars that go into the calculation of your Social Security benefit, Social Security replaces 90% of those first dollars. 
as compared to the highest dollars in Social Security, it provides a benefit of 10 percent on those very highest dollars, and it's 40 percent in between, right? Yeah, there so, are three, there are so three I, places. There's three, three in there. Three brackets, so, if, right. so if I were the king or queen for a day, Paul, I favor, because as a social insurance system, it's my judgment that it's really important that all generations, all generations, young, middle, and, 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 and older who are receiving benefits, contribute to solving the longer term financial challenges. So I would argue for a somewhat balanced set of benefit and, and, and slight tax increases that would put Social Security on a sustainable path. So it would be some increase in the, in the wage gap. It would be some increase in retirement age. It would be probably a phased in, very modest increase in the tax rate. And you could maneuver around quite easily some very modest pieces with delayed implementation dates and put it on a very solvable path and have all generations together hold hands and say we made the changes that were necessary to make Social Security fiscally sustainable. I think that's the right approach. All right, and so now you're, you're into the how, which is where I was in, in the discussion. But let's get back to that. Uh, Kalolo, you were going to say something, I think? No? Okay, so. Just, just um, he was asking about the, um, the formula, 90-32-15. 90, 32, 15, these are the three brackets and they change at what are called the bend points, which are the places at which, after which income, just like a marginal tax rate, after which the income is, ta your, your benefit is a lower percentage of, of what you put in. Now, Karen, uh, the, and I'm, I guess I should say, Karen, are, is there not a crisis? Well, let me throw this out. Social Security is the only program, as far as I know, that we have to project for 75 years. We have a lot of programs out there that we think we are going to keep the promises. We're still going to educate our kids, maybe not as well as we think we would. Uh, we have, um, you know, our veterans, our, and so there, there are clearly a lot of controversies about other programs, but this is the only one that we have to make projections about 75 years. Who's going to be, who around here is going to be here in 75 years? And so there are a lot of assumptions that are being made if you look closely at the assumptions. Uh, and when we talk about the trust fund running out of money or being depleted down to zero, we're really taking a set of assumptions uh, that may or may not uh, and probably won't, won't become, come about because some of them are very inconsistent with each other. Um, the, 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 some of the labor force and fertility assumptions are probably not going to, to happen in combination. So on some days I, I get pessimistic because I think, oh my goodness, there are terrible things that could happen. And sometimes I'm optimistic because we're looking 75 years into the future. I, uh, so, but that isn't to say we shouldn't be worrying about our immediate promises. And I think there are ways to, to close the, um, the, the gap, the accounting gap, and one of them is through raising the, um, the, the, the taxable limit, which Paul, the Center for American Progress, estimated that uh, if you raised it to 90%, and, and people pick 90% because that's the 90% of the covered wa of wages were covered when the system went into effect and now it's down to about 83 percent. Right. But if you covered it, uh, if you, you would raise, uh, you would close more than one quarter of the gap. Yeah, that was the 30. Uh, and I, then if you raised it entirely, because then you would be hitting really high income, uh, you would be getting closer to, to closing the gap. But, um, well, but let me I stop you for a second. Are you saying then that if we projected ahead the national defense budget, for example, for 75 years, we would face a similarly I huge think, yes, deficit. Yes, right. Uh, now, the difference, of course, here is that no other program has this very targeted uh, contribution uh, th that made to it. So there is there is a, a difference. But I think when when we talk about Social Security, we somehow think that this 75-year projection is what is going to happen, and we don't think about how the system will change or how we can change the system, and that's where I've gotten most concerned about. We, as a, 
as supporters of Social Security need to think about the, inequality, the income inequality that is, that is making Social Security financing actually worse because as the, as, as the benefits of income growth, earnings growth go to the, the, the groups above the taxable limit, Social Security is, you know, is replacing a higher and higher percentage of wages of those, those that, are, that are providing the, the income. And again, the American uh, uh, Center for American Progress has estimated that if, if wages had kept up, kept up with productivity growth since 1983, we would have, we would be, we would have about one, one fifth of the, of the gap closed. So there is an underlying uh, issue that we need to be concerned about, not just, you know, how do we tweak the system, but how do we look at the whole system that is underlying our earnings distribution system. And we need to be working on that, you know, better education, better, you know, technological uh, education. Uh, David, uh, the not a crisis? I mean, really? So, well, I think there's elements of a potential crisis in there. Um, before I answer that, let me just yeah, touch sure. on a couple of things uh, Karn mentioned. First, we're going to get to the hows yeah. right next. Yeah. So yes. we'll go to the so first, increased thanks age. For, and thanks so for forth. plugging a bunch of uh, Center for American Progress reports. I very much appreciate that. Uh, makes my life easier up just here. Just coincidence, but yes. you know you do, you do good stuff. <laughs> I appreciate that. The other element that you you hit on that I think is very important is this inequality, which is sort of what's happening in the larger economy to most families. And an element of that is that for most people, their incomes have been stagnant for quite some time. So just to, an example, the median in household income, so meaning half make more, half make less, has the same income as they, today as they did in 1989. Several decades of stagnation. At the same time, core costs for basic basic kind of middle class goods, housing, health care, higher education, child care, have skyrocketed, which makes saving for outside of Social Security very, very hard. In fact, debt for the typical household since 1989 has more than doubled, almost tripled. And so that, and then you have some problems with the private sector system, which I can talk more about, but that places all this pressure on uh, importance on Social Security because the broader economy is not working for most people. So that makes, so I guess, I, so that gets to this crisis or not. The, again, the, and I think Larry at some level put the, the, you know, the scope of the problem, it's a large number of dollars, but in terms of the kinds of tweaks we can make, it's eminently manageable. But if we don't make the, those tweaks, you have this situation that Kololo mentioned where benefits will be cut. And even if it's a relatively minor cut, whether you think 20%, you know, et cetera, is minor or not, uh, it is likely to be significant given how dependent people are on Social Security and uh, how little they have outside of the Social Security system to rely on. So, um, and given the, my original point, we have a political crisis, so that leads Social Security to be in crisis even though the actual solutions are not that hard. Okay, so then, so we started with the, the actual solutions or potential solutions, and Kalolo, you talked about the cap, cap being raised. We've all talked about it to some extent. Uh, you also said, or, or it has been attributed to you that you said uh, benefits uh, cut. Uh, do you think benefits will be cut? And I, I, by that, I guess, I mean net benefits, right? Because if you raise taxes on people, then in effect, their benefits are being cut, their net benefits, you know, net of taxes, right? Net, net of tax increases. Yeah, so if it was attributed to me, I, I don't recall saying benefits being cut, but if you're, if you're thinking, as you just posed it, that on the highest earners, the increase in the payroll tax is a, a cut for them, then, then I guess that would be, would be the case. Um, my position is that there is a need to look at benefit adequacy um, to look at ways of um, increasing revenue in order to restore the um, solvency, but there's also a need to look at um, ways to improve benefit adequacy for those who are, are most at risk of, of financial insecurity, retirement insecurity. So 
So, it's, but you worry that there's a crisis. You think there are, there's a set of, of possible solutions to it. One is the, is the uh, raising of the cap. And right. I think that's something that, at least in this group, would be extremely popular. Uh, what, what else? So, I mean, yeah. you've heard the other, some of the other, I, I can't remember who listed them, but right. I think it was Karen. But, you know, raising the age. Um, um, that. Well, well, somebody mentioned <laughs> it. I didn't, maybe it was David. No, so, Larry. Uh, Larry. Yeah, I, Larry did. Sorry. Larry, sorry. <laughs> I, I get I, confused. I don't think that Social Security is facing a crisis. I think that Social Security is facing insolvency if you look out, as Karen indicated, if you look at 75 years out, which is not what's done for, for other programs, but even with the, the level of insolvency that it's facing, it's, it is completely manageable that steps can be taken, as has been said, um, that can restore solvency. That's, I don't see that as a crisis. What else can be done? Yes. Um, other other um, options that have been proposed in the past is covering um, new state and local um, uh, employees. So so that they come into the Social Security system and are um, contributing to payroll taxes rather than being, um, rather than staying outside the, the system in the states that currently are not participating in, in Social Security. That's an, another um, approach to it. Um, another approach is treating um, uh, the uh, for a salary uh, 401k plans um, so that um, they are not exempt from, from payroll tax deductions. Um, you mean the, the retirement accounts would income from a retirement account? No, so that as for, for households that are, are currently able to set aside um, uh, savings and right, and tax exempt or tax paid, deferred. Right, they are exempt from from um, payroll tax deductions. One right, of the they're tax deferred on income, but they're not yeah. tax deferred on the Social Security. They're you tax pay Social exempt. Security tax on your 401k. Okay. Yeah, someone right. who knows that yeah. that better should probably. Yeah, I don't because. Yeah. Right. So that that that. What about what about? Let's take them uh, one at a time. But I did. Do want to say one thing? You've talked about you've talked about 75 a year time horizon. Again, my co-author Larry Kylikov insists to and drives you crazy with this that it should be an infinite time horizon, and that's the right, David. And that's another way people look at this and say, hey, over an infinite time horizon, which is the only actuarially correct way to do it, according to Larry, then it's an even bigger number. Although more of it is covered if you raise the cap, because the cap would also then be raised infinitely as incomes expand. Uh, so it's not just necessarily 75 uh, years that people are talking about. Uh, okay, so one, we talked about raising the cap. Another one, increasing the age. Larry, you did mention it. So I what did. about increasing the age? Why well, should we do that? Well, I mean, first Why of all, we? yeah, first, first of all, of course, everybody knows that we're, we're living longer. Um, you know, it's interesting to me, we talk about wanting to restore the, you know, the wages back to the 90% level that was in effect when Social Security was put in place, and I think that's a legitimate, you know, topic to look at, but if we're going to try to update, if you will, Paul, Social Security for what it should look like in the year 2015 as compared to 1936 when it was passed, well then I, I think to be fair, to be fair to the American people and to the American workers, then we need to sort of update it with respect to everything. And so, in my judgment, if we want to update with respect to wages, we ought to think about updating with respect to retirement ages as well. Now, again, to be clear, to be clear, this does not necessarily have to impact the lowest age, the lower age at which you're eligible for Social Security benefits, which is 60, which is 62. You can keep the age 62 as the age for the time when you first receive benefits, simply move up the retirement age over a period of time, change the early retirement factors so if people need to retire at 62, they're still able to do that. They may just get a, a marginally lower benefit if I retire in 2030 than if I retired in 2020, for example. So there are, again, there are, a, there are two dozen ways to make very modest adjustments with, and in my opinion, I believe it is critical 
that the adjustments be shared across all generations of workers. To me, that is fundamental to what a social insurance system, which is what Social Security is. It's not a retirement system. It's a social insurance system. It's a transfer system between generations. Therefore, in my judgment, each of the generations should make their proportionate contribution to putting Social Security on a sustainable basis. That's what I fundamentally believe. But Larry, the, an argument that, that's been made on the left for years, actually, or by some people on the left, has been that we oughtn't raise the cap for, for precisely the reason you just suggest, which is that it would alienate people from the system and that the constituency for Social Security wouldn't be there anymore. That's just been raising the cap. Is the, just I, going back to the cap raising for yeah, a second. Yeah, I, I think that's valid. I, I, I think I think that's I think that's valid. But remember that when you raise that cap, because again, this often gets lost. When you raise the cap on with respect to tax rates, remember that in at least Social Security, that's been constructed to this point, you also are raising the cap with respect to the the income on which you're going to calculate the benefit. Now again, you're in that very lowest replacement rate, that sort of 10 or 15 percent replacement rate, but, but the proposition of Social Security is that you earn some portion of benefit on every dollar on which you, are, which, on which you pay in a tax. That has been the value proposition of Social Security, and again, it's my personal judgment that it's important to retain that value proposition. Others would disagree. But I believe that if we're going to tax that, it also should then qualify for a benefit, albeit a very low benefit, for those higher income people. I see. So if you, I, I'd not ever heard this before. So if you raise the cap, but you also then use the same benefit formula, the 35 highest years of earnings, and you count the total earnings, then the people who are going to be taxed more will also get more. Well, but net net to. Kilo's point, net net, it's still a huge positive benefit to the system because of the progressivity. Because of the progressivity of the of the replacement rates that's and the true. formula with respect to Social Security. Okay, so that, and the, that's and the taxation of Social Security. Yeah. That you probably a good bit of that at the higher income levels would be taxed. Right, right. And income if, tax. And so, actually that's which would return to the Social Security Trust Fund. Right, that's very that's a very interesting point. But uh, so we, Let's leave the cap for a second, or you can take it on, Karen, if you want. But so we now we've got the cap being raised, and uh, age being raised. What do you think? Um, I think age is a complicated issue. There, there. It seems like a, a logical argument. However, just as our income inequality is widening, so is our mortality that uh, is widening that low-wage workers, uh, their mortality has not improved as much as high-wage workers. So that, um, you know, the mortality is in some ways offsetting the progressivity of our income tax over the lifetime of workers. That uh, low-income workers are increasingly li living much less long than high-income workers. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the issues that are, that has to be debated about raising the, it, it might be a very logical thing to do, uh, but we also have to think about the progressivity of the system, maintaining the progressivity of the system, if that's one of the values we want to maintain. Uh, Teresa Gilarducci of uh, the New School uh, has, has a book, I think, it was when, when You're 64, uh, and in that book she makes a strong argument against raising the age because of the, basically what you're talking about, with the difference. Right. The I mean, every, almost every, every reform that, would, that is proposed for Social Security, there, there are arguments on both sides, pros and cons. It's a difficult, and I think everybody would agree, this is not an easy issue. Even raising the cap is not an easy issue. Because then you have to, as we've said, as Larry said, we have to decide, well, how are we going to, what is going to be the next uh, bend point then in, in determining benefits? Um, and what are we, uh, and what is that cap going to be? Uh, the 90% of earnings is, in, is sort of thought, I think that's proposed because that's kind of an easy one to at, rationalize because that's what it was at the beginning of the program so we can say, oh, that's all right. <laughs> right. But I might just, I wanted to, to note that we do, uh, the cap is only effective for Social Security and disability, that uh, the cap, there is no cap on 
uh, on the Medicare mm -hmm. uh, uh, portion of the tax. And so there is a precedence there for, for lifting the cap. Right. Uh, Ghilarducci's point, uh, Teresa Ghilarducci's point is that think about a worker who's worked in a steel mill, leave it aside even the inequality of income issue. Somebody who's, who's desperately looking forward to retirement. I mean, literally can't do it anymore. I don't know how many of you know steel workers, but I've interviewed a lot of them, and I've been in steel mills, and I couldn't be in there for more than about an hour and a half uh, before. It was, uh, it was almost intolerable. Now, I'm sure you get used to it to a certain extent, but these guys were spent. I mean, and said they were spent. And the idea that you would then extend their eligible age until 66, 67, whatever, well, that's already, it's already six, right. going and to 67, but going to 70, let's say, or something and like that. And that's why I said we'd keep, you keep the eligibility age at which you could first qualify for benefit. Yeah. You're, mm -hmm. you're not but, disrupting that. Yeah, but you also said, and I quote, uh, uh, mar you will get marginally lower benefits. It's about 8% a year inflation adjusted. I mean, we, that's, we, that's we, not marginally lower. That's, we could decide how how big or small we wanted to make that adjustment, Paul. That's another area that we can adjust, which is what's called the early retirement factors. If we decided, even, frankly, even for certain categories of workers, that we could decide to make special adjustments. We have, we have dozens, almost unlimited changes that we can make here. But, but again, it, it is, I want to just emphasize in my judge, it's a social insurance system. It's not meant to be kind of an individually designed retirement system. It is, it is set up by definition for the entirety of the population, and you will always, you will always, in the nature of a social insurance system, get winners and losers. It's just, it's just part of the deal. Uh, David, we, we're still on age here, or wherever you want to take it, but that's where we are at the moment. Sure, I think on, on age, one of the key uh, elements you, you were mentioning with sort of the steel workers is, and there's, it's not just about steel workers, it's in fact most people are not able to work as long as they think. There's just, you know, people wildly overestimate how long they think they'll be able to, to work. And so you definitely have to be very cautious about uh, any sort of raising the retirement age, in addition to sort of the life expectancy issues we talked about. But people don't work as long as they, they think in many, many cases. Although more, but, more pe people they, are working, are working longer. But they still aren't working as long as they think they will work. Uh -huh. they, and for, for whatever reason, they just can't find a job. Their job changes. Their health deteriorates. Um, you know, a whole host of things happen just more and more as, as you, you get older. And um, so the, if you are going to design a system that is dependent upon people working older, longer, um, I think that's a, a real concern because pe many people just can't work as long. And it's not just about manual labor. It's just a fact of age. Um, but, and, but, and I think Karen's point is, is the relevant one then, which is the, the more you can't work when you're older, in general, the poorer you are. Yes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the more you need, the benefits you would not be getting, right? That yes. was your yes. point. Yeah. Yes. There's, let me just, there's a couple other sort of solutions that are worth having on the table for people to understand and think about. Yeah. Um, one, and this is, I think, a little bit about Larry's point about social insurance and sharing between generations. One thing we did in the past is we provided much higher benefits for either, depending on your age, your parents or your grandparents, than they paid in. And whether or not we, or the next generation, we need to pay for those benefits that we gave that were more right now. In fact, you know, some estimates are that's you know, maybe one-fifth of the uh, shortfall we face is because we provided higher benefits in the past, and how you treat those and pay for those is uh, you maybe that should be general, more general fund supported rather than Social Security supported, and so you could think about that uh, possibility. Another one is just more general payroll taxes, in addition to sort of, and maybe even thinking about making those more progressive, but also getting contributions from everyone, not just those at the top, uh, and then the last solution set to throw on the table is thinking about broadening the scope of what is taxed and that's we've heard the little elements of that but of you know with with uh, retirement benefits etc but I think you can broaden that even further that for example we allow capital income 
uh, to not be taxed in this in the current system, and more and more income goes to you know as inequality has arisen. One of the one of the elements of that is that those at the top have more and more of their income in capital income rather than uh, supposedly earned income. But the relationship you still have to work typically to get capital income, and so I think you can think about reducing those distinctions and think about that as another set of solutions. So you would t so. So unearned income or non-covered income would then fall under? Potentially, yes. How likely is that to happen, do you suppose? Well, it start. <laughs> I see Senator Harkin nodding and <laughs> shaking his head. How likely, Se Se Senator Se Harkin, how likely is that to happen? Depends on who's in Congress. Depends on who's in Congress, but he it's, said. It's an element of several proposals that you know are, are, are starting to be out there. And I think it's. Uh, and just on the sort of the broader politics here, I think you see, and Senator Harkin was a, a key part of this, the more progressive elements, uh, uh, people are putting out proposals that address solvency, maybe not fully, but address solvency by not just cutting benefits, but actually seeking to improve benefits. And you see, I think, see that as a broader solution set that we can, we can, shore up Social Security not just by cutting it to the bone, but by really modernizing it for the future and thinking about things so people living longer, for example. You have, uh, the, the older you are, the more and more dependent you become on Social Security. And so you can think about boosting those kinds of benefits. And so the, I really do think that, that you know, this capital income will be part of the future set of solutions. It's not fully there yet, but just as I think increasing benefits in, in certain, for certain groups of people will also be part of the solution set. Well, it's interesting. So we, we've been doing the keeping the promise part of this panel, it's, but this is also preparing for the future. Uh, and it's not just Social Security, obviously. It's pensions, 401ks, and the rest, right, Kalolo? Sure, yes. So what, are we okay there? I mean, we all know that people aren't saving enough. We heard this in the very beginning. But what do we do about um, how do we deal with the constituencies you're particularly concerned about with respect to pensions, 401ks, for? 403Bs and so forth. So we aren't doing well in terms of people being prepared to retire um, in the future. And in large part, it has to do with um, some workers who were never covered by um, pensions or who were less likely to be covered by pensions, um, workers who are in particular occupations, um, sales, retail, you know, administrative support, et cetera. Um, compared to those who are in managerial and professional positions who, who had pension coverage. But now that we're switching from a defined benefit pension, like we've had in the past, almost completely over to defined contribution, not only are we, is there the problem of people who were never covered before and, and still aren't covered, but those who used to be covered by defined um, benefit are may or may not be um, covered under defined contribution. And those who are, do have access to defined contributions through their employers may not be saving enough in them. So for all of those reasons, Social Security becomes even more important. But we need to also look at ways that we can assist people to save outside of Social Security since it was not ever intended to be the, the only source of, of retirement. Um, so there is now in law the ability of employers to do automatic enrollment of, of, um, of people into uh, retirement plans. Um, but we need to go a bit further and, and offer legislation for auto IRAs, automatic enrollment into IRAs. So for people who don't have a 401k plan but need to be um, cover need to save. Um, employers can, uh, through payroll deductions, channel some of their, their savings into IRA accounts. 